this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Deep Cool AG400. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to set up this 120mm CPU cooler with an Intel socket motherboard. And I am going to talk about what's included in the box and show you the various steps for the setup process. And we'll do some benchmark testing at the end. I'll leave all the specs of the build in the description. And I've gone into a depth on the case and other parts in another video, which is a lot longer. And I'll link to that in the description as well if you want to check it out and find out more about it and see the build process for it. I'm using this single 120mm CPU fan cooler in order to cool an Intel 13th generation i5 13600K. And I also tested it with a 12th generation i7 12700K. And the setup process is the same. There are brackets in the case that will work for both AMD and Intel, and you also have the necessary attachments to work with LGA 1700. So if you're using the latest generation from Intel, then it is possible, and I'll show you the steps here. But you can see once you've got everything out of the box, there's quite a few things going on here, but depending on which you're doing, you don't need one half of it. So I'm only gonna need the black parts and those screws at the top there, for example for this Intel build. So we can get rid of the AMD ones, which are the orange colored bits. And they're separated out, so it's easy enough to know which is which. And then you have essentially what you need, put those in a bag, put them to the side, and on we go. Now this is the Intel backplate, and you can see that it is adjustable. So for the LGA 1700 motherboards, which is a Z690 and Z790 motherboards, for example, you'll see that you need to put the pins into the far corners and push them out as far as possible. Then you'll also notice there are these standoffs and you can see them labeled with 1700 and you'll notice there are some differences. So there's eight black standoffs included. Some are round and some are notched. You'll see the round ones on the right hand side here that are marked 11.5x. Those are for 1150, 1156 motherboards so a different socket type and we want the 1700s that will work with this variant instead and then what we're going to do is basically install the back plate and the other bits now i'd recommend doing this before you install your motherboard it makes life a lot easier because things won't fall out you may find if you try and do this when your motherboard's already in the case that it's a bit fiddly or the back plate keeps falling out while you're trying to install the other things if you can put the back plate in then lay it flat and then put the standoffs and the rest of the brackets on top. It makes life a lot easier. We've basically got to ensure that those screws are poking through the holes in the four corners here, and then we have easy access to them. Now, this will vary depending on the motherboard you're using. If you're using a 1200 socket, for example, you need to push those pins in closer because the uh, setup is ever so slightly different. They're a different size, so the back plate needs to be set up in a different way. But the process is basically the same. So now we're using those 1700 standoffs I saw that you saw earlier on. They're the not notched ones again, and watch out because they've got 1700 written on. So don't mix them up because they will be a different size, which means the bracket won't sit in the right place if you use the wrong ones. Then seat this bracket down over the top of those. And then there are four screws included that we need to screw through into it. This is an NZXT N5 Z690 motherboard in case you're curious, which is a 12th gen motherboard, so it will take 12th gen CPUs, but also 13th generation with a BIOS update as well, which I've done a video on separately, how to do that and what you need to do to upgrade your CPU if you want to do that. And this is obviously a look at that process and part of the setup for it. So once that screws are all put in place, then you just need to seat them and screw them down. You will notice it's quite a tight fit. And obviously you need to take care when installing this at this point, we basically need to make sure these are all tight. And the good benefit of doing this before you install on the motherboard is this is all secure. Once these screws are screwed down, the back plate and this front bracket are all secured and ready to go. Then all you need to do is seat the cooler down on top of it. And that's mission complete essentially, as long as you've got the thermal paste in place, which I'll show you in a second. But what I mean is none of this is gonna fall off when you go through the process of installing the motherboard. So basically now you need to seat the cooler down. Now, important point of note, you need to make sure it's facing in the right direction. So basically we need to make sure the fan faces towards the front of the case because it's gonna be pulling air through the fan, through the radiator and out the rear and then exhausting out the rear of your case. If you flip it the other way, this may cause problems, especially if you have a rear fan that's also exhausting out of the case because then they'll end up fighting each other. So make sure you follow the same logic that I'm going to do. You'll see some more clips of that in a second. In the box, you also have this thermal paste in a small little bag. A base that needs to be applied. Most people would say put a pea-sized amount in the middle and then just seat the cooler down on top. I personally 
like to spread it out. I have a little spatula tool where you can spread it out. You need to make sure there's a good covering, a thin covering across the entirety of the CPU once the cooler is in place. This ensures good thermal conductivity and keeps the CPU running cool as well. So it makes sure that the thing runs at maximum efficiency. And here is the process for mounting. So once that thermal paste is down, we just need to push the cooler down on top of it and the screws fit on either side. So you'll see that there's little pins sticking out of the plate we've already installed and then you push it down this way. Again, note the position of the fan and the direction that's facing. That fan was already pre-installed on the cooler, so there's no need to worry about installing that. You just need to make sure you're mounting it in the right direction. So in most cases, if you've got it installed this way, you'd have a front fans on the front of the case pulling air through into the case itself, and then this fan will suck it through over the radiator and blow it out the back, and then your rear fan will hopefully suck that hot air out the back as well. This single fan setup should be enough for mid-range CPUs, for example, the i5, and it should run it cool enough. And I'll show you some of the thermal performance and benchmarks later on. Now, the little fan connector that comes out of the cooler needs to be connected to the CPU fan head on your motherboard, which you can see here next to the RAM. It may vary in position. Sometimes it's below the CPU on the left. Sometimes it's up in the top right here. It's mostly up in the top right, so it should roughly be in the same position depending on what motherboard you're using. So that's one single fan connection, fairly straightforward. And then there's the other connection, which is the RGB connector, which connects up to the bottom of the motherboard generally. It's a three pin RGB header. So you're looking for the five volt ARGB or RGB connection on the bottom of your motherboard. You can see it here. This one is gray. It only has three pins. You'll notice the one next to it, a 12 volt RGB one. That won't work because it has four pins on it. One difficulty that I did have with this is the cable's quite short. So ideally you'd run this sort of cable around the back of your case and then come up through the bottom. But there's not much space to do that in this case. So I ended up having to do this, basically running it like this. The cable's just not long enough in my opinion. I wish it was a bit longer. But you might find that you have an RGB connection at the top of your motherboard instead. This one doesn't, but I have seen other ones that do. So it's worth noting. Once that's all set up now, obviously we can go about the process of installing the motherboard in the case. I'm not going to go into a great depth in here, but hopefully you know how to do this anyway. Basically installing this and then using the nine screws that are included with your case to install the motherboard in there and then plugging everything else in, connecting up all the cables, all the power cables and everything else that's required. And then just turning it on to make sure it's working. So this is now the finished setup. And you can see the RGB cable I was talking about and how it sort of goes through and down to the bottom, it looks kind of messy. I just really couldn't get the length through. It looks like there should be enough, but there really wasn't in this case to run it across the top, down the back and out through the bottom. Just wasn't enough room to stretch it that far, unfortunately. So it doesn't look that great, but you do have RGB lighting. Now the RGB is obviously going to be controlled by your motherboard software. So it will vary depending on what software you're running and what motherboard you're using, but you then can choose the lighting for that. You'll see there's not much lighting going on in this case. But if you have more deep cool fans, you could potentially sync them up as well if you have the connectors connected up correctly. And that's the final result. So here you can see more shots of the positioning of it and how it will run. And that's what it will look like once you've finished. Obviously, this is the white one. I also use the black one in my testing and the results are the same, just a different color. <laughs> and here is some benchmark tests of how that went. So in order to test it out around Cinebench R23, now this puts it under heavy load. Now Cinebench is a free tool that you can use to benchmark CPUs and it is thoroughly aggressive so it will actually give you a more aggressive test than you would get from just playing games or running usual day-to-day -day activities. So it puts the CPU under a lot of load which results in temperature increases. I am using hardware info on the right hand side which is another free tool that you can use for monitoring things and it tests and checks of the performance of it. Now this is a good tool to check and make sure everything's installed correctly. You may find that once Cinebench has finished running or even during it, that the temperatures get a bit hot. If you have a higher end CPU, this could be just down to that power. For example, the i7 and i9 CPUs are often run very hot nearing the 100 degree mark but in this case obviously that isn't quite the case but I did note that sometimes the temperatures were a little bit toasty you can see for example that the maximum temp this got up to was about 97 which is still fairly hot now it could be 
the thermal paste just hasn't been applied properly in some areas. If it hasn't got a proper spreading across the entirety of the CPU and thin, if there's a bit missing, that can actually lead to it getting too hot. So if you do find that you have multiple cores, you'll see the P cores and the E cores, for example. If you notice any of them are particularly hot, especially getting into the 100 degree mark or even the very high end 90s, it might be worth taking the cooler off, having a look at the paste and reapplying and then reseating or even just checking that you've screwed it down properly and that it is secured nicely in place so there's a good connection. It could just be something as simple as that. But also note that Cinebench does run things really hot. This won't be a standard load. If you are concerned, you can play games and do other intense activities that you would normally do and run hardware info at the same time and then you'll be able to see the maximum temperatures that your CPU got to. Hopefully you found this video useful. Check out all the links in the description to find out more. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.